cloth over their shoulder and they walk backwards. They creep up on him backwards and cover him up so as not to see their father naked. That was a taboo in their culture. Okay. And Noah woke from his wine and knew what his younger son had done unto him. That part's not necessarily logical. Because when you wake up with a bad head, you don't know who did what to you. <laughs> but, and he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants, shall he be unto his brethren. Now, that's the story. Sir. Oh, I was going to say, in other words, I know they put it in another way, in other words. I don't know, you know you're right as to me. In other words, saying that uh, they raped him. His father, in other words, that's why he was cursed. Sodomy on him, really. Well, I don't, I don't necessarily see sodomy in the story. Mm -hmm, but somebody that I have, I don't okay. know if I'm able to find it, not going to have that. The simple point I'm trying to make here is that when you read the story, it wasn't Canaan who was involved in the first place. It was his daddy, Ham. Now, what some of the historians say is that this was nothing but a thinly veiled reason to support why the Hebrews felt they had a right to take over the land of Canaan. They had to say something was wrong with the people who were in Canaan to give them possession of it. So they go back and find this story about Canaan's daddy, Ham, having seen his father, Noah, naked. Now, if I were to find any blame in this story, I wouldn't blame Ham or Canaan. Only person I could blame in the story is Noah. He's the one who was drunk. <laughs> you know. <laughs> then Benjamin Ben, ben jo uh, Yonah came along later on. He was a 12th century Hebrew merchant. And he wrote, there's a people who like animals eat of the herbs that grow on the banks of the Nile in the fields. They go about naked. They have not the intelligence of ordinary men. They cohabit with their sisters and anyone, anyone they find. These are Ham. These sons of Ham are black slaves. So again, he's somebody making a comment on black people who didn't know anything about black people. Now, it, it very well may be, and this, I, I can't authenticate this yet, we already know that those persons who become modern Jews convert to Judaism. So it, it may be that part of what is done here is you have Europeans now casting aspersions on black people whose identity they've, they've already assumed. This happens very often in history. Uh, the Hebrews get their entire religion from Egypt. They then, of course, have to make denigrate Egypt in their text, the Bible, to make Egypt look like the bad people. The European Christians get their whole religion from the Hebrews. They then denigrate the Hebrews. <laughs> see, you see, so that this this happens very often. People when they come and do bad stuff to you, very often have to make up a reason why either you didn't have nothing they, should, they could steal in the first place or why they had a right to take it from you because you wasn't doing nothing with it. <laughs> yes, sir. Is this B.C., A.D.? Uh, this is A.D. This is A.D. Sir. Hebrew, the word Hebrew literally means, comes from the word Haribu, it means wanderer. Originally, the Hebrews, ethnically, are African people. Okay? Now, after those persons leave out of Egypt, they form a, a, a nation organized very much like Egypt into two kingdoms, an upper kingdom and a lower kingdom. Just as Egypt had an upper kingdom and a lower kingdom. They call the upper kingdom Israel, they called the lower kingdom Judah. Basically, ten communities of people lived in the upper kingdom, and two communities of people lived in the lower kingdom. In the lower kingdom were the Benjamites and the Judeans. Once you get to AD, there is the migration of people out of Israel when they're attacked by Assyria, what we now call Persia or Iraq. They took those people in Israel away, put them in slavery. Well, in church, you probably uh, read about that. Uh, they sing songs about it. By the wars of Babylon, we sat down and wept. We remembered the old Zion. How can we sing the Lord's song in this strange land? 
Okay, at that point, Israel basically disappears off the globe. What's left is Judah. In Judah, the mem the, the people who were the Judeans outnumbered the Benjamites ten to one. That's why the country had their name. Much later, around 700 A.D., these Judeans are in trade with people in Central Europe. Christianity has started in 325 A.D. Islam starts 623 A.D. These folks find themselves between these two competing religions. It's the year 700. They don't want to be subsumed into either one of the religions. And so they adopt the religion of the people, the merchants they've been trading with, the, Jude the Judeans. They adopt Judeanism, what we now call Judaism. They convert to that religion. So the religion goes from having black people originally to now having white people. If you trace any of the white Jews back, their, their people go back to Germany and Poland and Russia. And that's where they end up. Yes, sir. Where geographically, when you say Israel, what geographically in this period of time uh, are you referring to? It was basically, basically where it is now. Oh, really? Yeah. That was, that was part of the rationale for putting it back there. Uh, the only problem was that the folks who went back and claimed the land were not ethnically connected to the people who had been there originally. Right. It'd be like us adopting the Mohawk. That we Mohawks, and now we want to go back and take whatever land the Mohawks had 100 years ago. Well, that could be done if we had the power to do it. But somebody sat down and said, "Now, how do you could be a Mohawk?" Finally, it had to come out. It was by conversion. It's not by blood. James Houston was considered an authoritative source uh, in 1725. He wrote, they, meaning Africans, exactly resemble their fellow creatures and natives, the monkeys. He wrote a book called Some New and Accurate Observations of the Coast of Guinea. That's what he said about us. David Hume was an influential Scots philosopher. He said, I am apt to suspect the Negroes to be naturally inferior to the white. There never was a civilized nation by any other complexion than white. Nor even any individual eminent either in action or speculation. No ingenious manufacturers amongst them, no arts, no scientists. Now, of course, that's extreme ethnocentrism. He's saying anybody here but us. We had a, con we had a councilman here years ago, Julius Hobson Sr., who had that kind of attitude. Julius Hobson would say, all those in favor of my motion say, I, everybody else get the hell out. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't last too long, unfortunately. George Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel, Hegel, the great German philosopher, he wrote a book called Philosophy of History, and after a brief discussion of Africa, he devoted eight pages out of 370-some um, pages to um, Africa. He then concluded by saying, it is manifest that want of self-control distinguishes the character of the Negroes. This condition is capable of no development or culture, and as we have seen them at this day, such have they always been. At this point, we leave Africa, not to mention it again, but there's no historical part of the world. It has no movement or development to exhibit. Okay. So he says now Africa not even part of the world. <laughs> okay. uh, pardon me, Doctor. Sir. That even in Genesis, it said when the whole world was one, Africa. <laughs> And then in, in uh, Genesis, the, uh, I think the 25th chapter, the 10th verse, it said when the whole world was one. Well, Mr. Hegel, the whole world was Africa. Mr. Hegel said that Africa is no part of the world. And folks who lived in Germany believed him. Josiah Strong was a 19th century historian, lecturer and clergyman. He said, it seems to me that God, with infinite wisdom and skill, is training the Anglo-Saxons for an hour sure to come in the world's future. The final competition of races, which the Anglo-Saxon is being schooled. Whether the extinction of inferior races seems to the reader sad or otherwise, it certainly appears probable. Hmm. So he figured out, as far as he's concerned, 
Everybody's going to snicks. When you end up talking to yourself, that's the kind of thing you can make up. Will Smith went to Africa the first time when he went to Mozambique to film the movie Ali. And he said, everything I knew about Africa was solid 80% false. He told a reporter for the Los Angeles Times. I was embarrassed when I realized there were tall buildings and Mercedes and big cities and fine women. <laughs> I was so miseducated, Smith said. It, meaning Africa, has the best and worst of everything. It's like God visits everywhere else, but he lives in Africa. All right. Now, uh, at this point, I'm going to switch to another presentation to show you some other stuff here. Talking now about why there was confusion and conflict over Africa. Now these are not too very clear. Let's see if I can make them bigger. I went back and got some of the things that Herodotus had said. Herodotus was, an, was a, a Greek who actually went to Africa. Uh, he predates all the people who I've just been quoting. And Herodotus had a number of writings about Africa, if I can, if I can read them. Uh, I'm going to make that clearer. able to see that as well as I thought I could. He says, the names of nearly all the gods came from Egypt to Greece. That these gods come from barbarians. Now, Greeks call everybody other than Greeks barbarians. Remember I talked about ethnocentrism? That was the term they used for everybody who's non-Greek was barbarian. Okay. That these gods came from the barbarians um, I found the inquiry to be true. Personally, I believe they came from Egypt. For except for, for, for Poseidon and just a court, as I mentioned before, and also Heria, and he named some others, all the rest of them have always existed in Egypt. So Herodotus says the gods come from Egypt. One of the people I quoted a little while ago said there were no gods in Egypt. So they had no custom of a god. Herodotus says there was another custom which the Egyptians have in common with the Lydamonians, alone among the Greeks. Young men, when they encounter the elders, yield the road to them and step out of the way. Also, when old men approach, the young men stand up from their seats. But in this, they are like none of the Greeks. Instead of speaking or greeting, to one another in the streets, they do obsolescence, dropping the hand to the knee. So Herodotus was saying that what he observed in Egypt was very much different than what he observed in Greece. He said that the young people in, in, in Egypt had respect for the elders, which by inference, of course, lets you know the young people in Greece had none. He says that they step out of the way when the elders come past them. That we, we in, in, in Greek, Greece, we greet each other, but he says that they do opposite. Yes, they bow, placing their hands on their knees. So that's culture, that's civilization, that's custom, that's all the things that the previous writers say didn't exist. Now, of course, 
You say, well, he's talking about Egypt. Egypt is typical of Africa. But now you can begin to see why it became necessary that Egypt had to be made a place totally separate from Africa, the continent to which it's connected. Because if, unless you separated Egypt and created this whole new place in people's minds, so that people wouldn't even associate Egypt with being in Africa, then they would naturally and normally recognize that this is consistent throughout that entire continent. Yes. I can make one comment.